All right, Mr. Wood, the state can call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Brandon Boudreau. Conducting direct examination. I will, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Smith. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help me, God. All right. Thank you, Mr. Boudreau. If you'll come around this way and be seated in the seat to my left. few quick instructions. We're making a record of the case, so please make verbal responses to any questions. Say yes or no instead of shaking your head. For example, please try to avoid talking at the same time anyone is questioning you. And with that in mind, Ms. Smith, you can inquire. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Can you introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury, please? Yeah. Uh, my name is Brandon Boudreau. I'm from Mesa, Arizona. Okay. Sir, could you spell your last name, please? B-O-U-D-R-E-A-U-X. Okay. Um, Mr. Boudreau, uh, are you married? I am. Um, how many times have you been married? Twice. Okay. Um, let's... Sure. Sorry. Okay. And you, I think it'll help if you just lean just a little for, forward. It might be a little uncomfortable, but it, um, lots of people need to hear. Okay. okay. All right. Um, and you said you'd been married twice. Can, let's talk about your first marriage. Who were you married to? Uh, Melanie Cope at the time she became Boudreaux. Okay. Um, and um, with your marriage to Melanie Boudreaux, uh, did you have any children? I did. How many? Um, four. Okay. And um, what are their ages? Um, I have Braxton, um, who is 13. Brighton, who's nine, Blake, who's seven, and Breeze, who just turned six. Okay. How long were you married to Melanie? Um, a little over 10 years. Okay. Um, uh, what year did you marry? Uh, 2008. Okay. And during that time, did you meet her family? I did, yes. Okay. Um, can you tell us uh, who you remember or who you had relations with? Um, I... I mean, she has a, a big family, so her, her mom passed away when she was young. So I met her uh, birth mom's family, um, her dad's family, and then her stepmom's family. When you say her birth mom's family, what are um, their names? Um, the Coxes. Okay. Um, and if you could just scooch just a little closer. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. I know. It's all right. Um, and so the Coxes, what are their names, please? Um, uh, Barry and Janice Cox are her. Um, that'd be her uh, grandparents. And then um, Adam Cox, uh, Summer Shiflett, uh, Lori Ballow, and Alex Cox. Okay. And those four people are who to Melanie and therefore were to you? Um, they would be her aunts and uncles. Okay. Therefore, your aunts and uncles in laws. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you spend much time with Lori's aunts and uncles? I mean, Melanie's aunts and uncles? Um, yes, um, we, um, before we got married, uh, I met them in Arizona, um, and, um, we would spend, um, you know, most holidays together. We would, um, when I, when I first, right after I was married, I moved down to Arizona. I actually lived with, um, Lori for a while and, um, and her husband, Charles. So when you say Lori, do you see the person you um, recognize and knew um, through marriage as Lori Vallow here in the courtroom today? Yeah, I do. Okay. Can you please point uh, her out and describe an item of her clothing? Um, she's sitting over on my right with glasses on. Okay. Your Honor, may the 
Um, what table, just so that the record's real clear? Um, the, the second table. Okay. How many people are at it? There's three. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect he's identified the defendant, please? Yes, that's reflected now on the record. Thank you. Um, now, uh, you said you'd spent time in uh, Ms. Vallow's home um, with Charles, correct? Yes. All right. And um, at that time, was he her husband? Yes. All right. How well did you get to know them? Um, very well. You know, we, we uh, just spent a lot of time together. Okay. When you say we, the, what does that mean? Uh, me and my family, my, okay. my wife of the, at the time and my children. Okay. Um, and um, did you get to know her children, uh, Ms. Vallow's children? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, what were their names? Um, there's Colby, Tylee, and JJ. Okay. Um, and uh, um, when you say you got to know them, did your kids also interact with their cousins? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we did. We um, they spent a lot of time together. Um, my oldest, Braxton, was pretty close with JJ. Um, I think, uh, you know, JJ uh, looked up to him a lot. And um, and they, um, they spent a lot of time together. Okay. Um. So would they spend any time time in each other's homes? Yeah. Um, you know, JJ wasn't, uh, he wasn't super interactive as, a, as, you know, he had autism, so he wasn't always, like, incredibly interactive. But um, he seemed to love hanging out with my kids, and specifically uh, Braxton and Brighton. Um, as he got older, he started to be able to interact a little more, and he would always... Um, he kind of had two fascinations. One was with um, traveling. We always, he always, everybody always got him suitcases. He had suitcases everywhere. Um, and and the other was coming and hanging out with with Braxton. He would always ask for that, and um, they had a great time when they when they spent time together. Okay. And what about Tylee? Um, <clears throat> yeah, did I spent a lot of time with Tylee as well? Um, I watched her grow up. Uh, I met her when she was just little, and then um, got to watch her kind of grow into a teenager. Okay. Um, did you have any um, special sort of religious connection to Tylee? Yeah. Um, uh, in, in our church, when you uh, turn eight, uh, you can get baptized if you choose. And um, so when she turned eight, she decided to get baptized, and... Um, for whatever reason, Charles wasn't comfortable doing the baptism, and so uh, they had asked me, and I, I of course said yes. I would be honored to baptize her. And you say in your church, um, what church is that? What's your faith? Um, I go to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. And was Tylee baptized into that church? She was, yes. Okay. Um, were you and your wife uh, members of the um, Church of Latter-day Saints? Yeah, we were. Okay, um, and to your knowledge, what about Mr. and Mrs. Vallow? Yes, as well. Okay. Um, did you, um, what about the relationship sort of between, that you observed between Melanie Boudreaux and uh, Lori Vallow? What was that like? Yeah. Um, you, you know, Melanie, uh, she kind of had like a, an affinity towards uh, Lori. She um, she always kind of um, she she looked at her uh, kind of less like an aunt figure and almost more like a mom figure. She she was always um, wanting to be like her. Um, did you get along with Charles? Yeah, yeah, really well. Um, Charles and I both. Uh, had a passion for sales and in business and um we connected well in that and um you know we just uh both loved our families and so it was very easy for us to spend time together um so it wasn't uncommon that the Boudreaux and the Vallows would get together and get along yeah we would you know there was years where they lived by us and we would usually see each other maybe once a month or more um and then there was times when they lived further away, um, but we would travel to each other's homes, stay in each other's homes when we went, and 
wasn't uncommon to spend a week, you know, or more at, at each other's homes. Okay. Um, did you spend holidays together? Yes. Okay. Um, what was the last Christmas that the Boudreaux's and the Vallo spent together? Um, that would have been in uh, 2018. Okay. Was that a typical Christmas? Um, For the two couples? No, it was a... Uh, it was definitely different at that point. Why? Um, you, you, when you get really close with people, um, you kind of become comfortable and you let your guard down and you, um, you know, your body language is more relaxed and more comfortable and it, and it just, everything kind of, I don't know how to, you, you know, it, it can be so fluid. You can see each other and, and pick right up where you left off. Um, but everybody feels like they know everything about each other, almost like it's just, you, you know, you're, you're so, you know each other so well that it's, it's like memory, um, if you will. But, um, and, and that one, um, it, it was very, well, there was, there was, uh, Melanie Gibb who was there, who I'd never met before, um, and never heard anything about, um, and, um. So let me stop you there and let me ask. So, you said it it wasn't the same as before. Were there other people there for this holiday? Yeah, um, yeah. The, Melanie Gibb was there with her family, um, who I didn't I, I didn't really know her, and and the rest of us were all um, uh, it just just didn't feel we didn't feel close. The body language was very um, in in the way that the conversations flowed and everything just felt very distant. Now, around this time, um, were you and your wife active in your church or in your ward? Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, had you been um, active with the Valos in your faith? Could, could you maybe expand on that? Sure. Had you and the Valos shared that faith and shared, active, shared activities at church? Um, yeah. We, we definitely um, had, had done things at church together. Okay. Um, and did your wife's and or, Mrs., the, let's take it one at a time, did your wife's activity in um, religious um, events increase around this time, around that Christmas? Yeah, um, a little bit before it actually, but... Um, Can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so when we first got married, um, my my wife's kind of religious level was was kind of low. She didn't enjoy going to church. It wasn't something that she. Uh, it was it was more me pushing going to church. Uh, I, I felt like I got like a little bit of um, a benefit from it, and she didn't really enjoy it that much. And so, for most of our marriage, it was kind of me pushing going to church. Um, but kind of in the fall of that year. When you, we're talking 2018. Yeah, sorry. In the, in the fall of 2018, um, she started getting really passionate about going to church and about different ideas within the church. Um, she started going to these things. She was calling firesides. When you say calling firesides, are firesides within the LDS faith? Are those a common practice? Um, so in, in the LDS faith, our... Um, the way we our, our setup is organized is um, our congregation is called a ward, and there's usually some leaders inside the ward, um, and then there's a bigger congregation called a stake, and um, in, inside of that, uh, usually ecclesi- ecclesiastical leaders um, organize uh, the regular Sunday events, but you also occasionally will have like um, we call them, they call them firesides, but like a special event that focuses on something around our our belief. Um, and in this case, um, so the, in the fire, were the events that your wife attending called firesides sort of part of the organized part of your church? No. And that, and that's, I guess what started kind of, um, sticking out to me was, uh, she, she would go to these things that she was calling firesides, but they weren't put on by the church. They didn't have any ecclesiastical connection. Like there wasn't any, anything like that, but they were using that term, um, and um, she was coming home with kind of different ideas of what she was going to do to to be a faithful member of the church. Okay. Um, um, was the defendant at some of these firesides? Um, yes. 
Okay. Um, did Charles go to any of these fireside talks? No, not not that I'm aware of. Okay. And and were you invited? Uh, no, I had a discussion with uh, Melanie, and she told me that um, these were her thing, and she didn't want me to go, and it was very clear that I wasn't welcome to come. To your memory, who was attending some of these, you know, extra church activities? Um, besides Melanie and Lori. Is that besides asking? Melanie and Lori. Your Honor, I'm going to object. It sounds like he doesn't have information as to who was there. Uh, it w any information that he would have got would have been hearsay. I'll sustain that. I think there's okay. an adequate foundation. Okay. Um, were you aware of who attended some of these events? Um, not, uh, not in the present, but afterwards, yes. Okay. Did any of the people who later went to those told you they had attended those? Um, yeah, I had a conversation with Melanie Gibb later where she told me she went to those. Okay. Again, it's hearsay. And that will be stricken as hearsay. The okay. statement of what another said. All right. But you weren't allowed to go to these talks. Correct. All right. Um, and when you say some of the ideas your wife came back with, um, did they center around particular topics? Um, yeah, the, the things that were, uh, she, she felt a need um, to go to the temple every single day, um, which... Um, it's a little bit extreme, and in, in, like in our faith, we believe in going to the temple, and I think regular attendance can be good. It's it's um it's something where you you go and kind of uh, practice ritualistically, like uh, your, your faith, and and show God that you are trying to keep promises to Him. Um, and and so it's a good thing to do. But um, it's, is it unusual to go every single day? Very, and, and, and it got even more extreme. Like she would have to go during like. Um, our family trips to Disneyland or things like that that just were uh, very, very overwhelming. Um, she had a focus on, um, on, on this idea that like the world could end soon and we needed, we had a, we had a disagreement about buying $10,000 worth of food storage right away. Um, th things that just seemed, uh, extreme. Okay. Um, and so it, um, in this situation, you've been to the Christmas and your wife is participating in these, these extra religious events. Did, um, the situation, but did that affect the situation between sort of the Boudreaux and the Vallos going into 2019? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, um, it got, it got a little bit, um, harder for us. Um, why? Excuse me. Um, do you need some water? Yeah, yeah, actually. Do you mind, if, Your Honor, if it takes a second? Not at all. It's there Thanks. for the witness. Thanks. Can you ask me that question again? Um, in going into 2019, did the situation between the Boudreaux and the Vallos was it affected by this religious activity or the, the sort of atmosphere at Christmas? Um, yeah, it just kind of got more bizarre. Um, at, at, in, the, in the 2019, the, um, in January, we uh, got a, a, a call and text messages from, from Lori and Charles that um, Lori was uh, accusing him of cheating and infidelity. Um, how did you respond to that situation? Um, well, it was kind of complicated. Uh, Why? For me, well, because um, initially when, when all this started happening, you know, I, I wasn't really, like, I, I wasn't even aware of it that the night that it happened. Um, uh, and um, when I became aware of it, it, it just seemed odd. Um, you know, there, there was... Um, it seemed kind of like it just went from zero to a hundred really quick. Like, uh, Lori had removed all the money from their account. She had, um, so let me, let me, let me stop you there and break it up. So did the situation, did that affect the situation with your family? Yeah, it did. Um, my, my wife was very adamant that we we're going to take sides. Um, and did you respect, um, Melanie's wishes on that? Yeah, I did my best. Yes. Okay. 
Um, and did there come a time um, during this period that you would see um, Lori in the early, late winter, early spring of 2019? Um, I, I didn't see Lori very much at all, um, but I did see Charles. Okay. So um, how often would you see Charles? Um, he would bring JJ over to play a couple times. Um, he, he, had, he had JJ. Um, Lori wasn't um, with JJ at the time. She, I don't know where she went actually. Um, uh, but um, so Charles would come over to your house with JJ. Yeah, and um, and so what would JJ do at the house? He would play with Braxton and um, and just kind of get a release. So J- JJ was always uh, very high energy. He had to like lock everything up when he came so that he couldn't get him get out of the house or get himself into trouble. So it'd be kind of thorough. Um, it was like having a really big um, kid that doesn't know how to like, you know, make certain decisions yet. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was a lot of work when he'd come over, but you know, you just loved him. So you, you did it. But um, so Braxton kind of always knew that his duty was to play with JJ and, and entertain him and keep him kind of busy so that um, he, he wouldn't, he would, he would get into less, you know, trouble or get into less things. Got it. And so did you spend time with Charles when JJ was there? I did, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, how? Um, let's fast forward to that um, that summer. Did you have occasion to um, go to a family a trip or visit your wife's family in Utah? Yeah, I did. Um, uh, so I um, after after um, meeting with Charles those couple times and um, kind of seeing him go through some painful process uh um i I, according as i promised melanie i kept asking him not to come over and you know doing my best to help him but trying to create distance and so we we actually um that kind of that summer went out and uh, went to utah to my my wife's sister was going to get married and we were staying at my in-laws house okay um did anything unusual happen at your in-laws house um yeah um so my, um, this was in June, um, and, uh, to, to explain it, you know, my, on June 23rd, my grandfather, um, passed away of a heart attack and, um, I got a little bit, uh, it was a, his health wasn't great, but it was still a surprise. And so, um, on the 25th, my mom called me to tell me about the funeral, um, and I had this conversation with Melanie where I told her when it was, and she told me she wasn't going to go to the funeral. She didn't want anything to do with it. And it created kind of a... A disagreement between you two? Yeah, yeah, a disagreement. Um, and in, in that process, this uh, what, I, what I thought we were arguing about with like her not wanting to go to my grandpa's funeral, not wanting my kids to go kind of escalated into something completely different and just kind of cascaded into a bunch of stuff that didn't make any sense and had nothing to do with me or to do with this. All right. And when you say to do with this, um, did it lead to some accusations against you? Um, yeah, it, after I, after I, um, I took a little break after I felt so emotional about my grandpa. I walked for a while. I came back and I really wanted to break through and have like a, honest conversation with her so i i just came and apologized for my feelings and just told her that i would uh, accept her not going to my grandpa's funeral and i just begged her to um talk to me about what's going on and why things were so hard and she said that if i um if i was honest then we could work through things and she said god had revealed some things to her um and so i i just said let's talk about them like what is it what is it? what's between us and she started out by accusing me of um of hacking her aunt Lori's computer. Um, had you hacked your aunt Lori, her aunt Lori's computer? No, no, okay. I don't know anything about hacking, and um, that was not something I did. Um, it was it was really illogical, uh, which which stuck out to me and and frustrated me because I just I didn't know why it had anything to do with what we were fighting about. Um, how did that conversation end? Um, it escalated some more. Uh, hours and then I um I kept trying to talk through it with her 
Um, eventually, I um, her, her father got involved, and we talked to him. And I tried to. She wouldn't talk to him with me, but I talked to him, and she was saying she didn't feel safe with me at the house, and, and, and she accused me of um, being a homosexual, which is another thing that didn't make any sense. But Charles had been telling me previously she was going to say. Okay. Lori was going to convince her. Okay, so she made those various accusations. How did how did it end? Um, it it ended with um, her going to sleep and um, me feeling kind of overwhelmed. And finally, I I um, I texted Charles and Lori that I was frustrated with them. That I felt like this was on them. And did you ever hear back from the defendant? Lori never answered or responded. Um, Charles talked to me. Did you, um, without getting into what somebody told you, what contact? What what day was this? Uh, June twenty fifth, and in, in in past midnight, so into the twenty sixth. Okay. Um, did you have additional? Uh, and that's twenty sixth of June, correct? Yeah. Okay. Did you have additional conversations with Charles um, in the following few days? I did. Um, I. Uh, talked to him again after I uh, kind of worked through some stuff with my with my dad and my ecclesiastical leader, and I went to a counseling session. I called him. Oh, sorry, with my dad, um, with my ecclesiastical leader, our, our bishop is what we call him, and then um, and then I went to a counseling session, um, just feeling a little overwhelmed, and then I uh, called Charles that night and talked to him. That was the last time I, I talked to him and just, I felt kind of maybe like he was the only person who knew what I was going through because he'd gone through all these things earlier and um, just told him I'm sorry okay. for not being there. Because you'd kept your distance at your wife's request. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said that's the last time you talked to him. You didn't talk to him again before he died? No. Okay. After Charles died, did you have contact with uh, the defendant, Lori Vallow? Uh, no. Okay. After Charles died, did you have contact with J.J. and Tylee? No. Okay. Um, how did it progress for you um, in your relationship with your wife? Um, did you eventually reconcile or did you divorce? No, we, we ended up divorcing. Okay. When did you divorce? Um... Well, uh, we we did a mediated divorce, so we started the process after I got back from my grandpa's funeral. She uh, left. She just took our car home, so I took my kids and flew home. Um, on a, um, and when I when I got home, she let me know that we had to do a mediated divorce. We had to do a divorce, and so that would have been in July. I started um, going through the process. Um, and so we uh, we met. With, I found a mediator after consulting some people and hearing that that would be the lowest conflict way to divorce. I tried to follow through with that. So we we went through that process, and um, uh, that that started. Um, I, I can't say exactly which day, but one probably around the first of July. Okay. Um, and then, um, did you complete? Um, did you continue working on the divorce and separation? Through that summer and fall, I did yes. Okay, um, and where were you living in the end of September and beginning of October of two thousand nineteen? Um, at, at the end of September, I was uh, selling my house, my home that we had bought together. I had moved uh, Melanie to a rental property, um, and uh, then I, as soon as I. Sold my house. I got a rental property as well for the time being, just to try to create some stability. I um, rented a property right back in where my old ward was, where I had lived before. Okay. Um, and so, how how did that situation work out? Were you able to share custody? Um, I mean, it was complicated. She uh, she was just so standoffish. So it was really hard for me to like when when I was showing the house, she wouldn't. We had agreed that I would go see my kids and that um, I could put them to bed each night, but she wouldn't actually let me in her home. She said she was scared of me. And so I, I didn't get a lot of time with my kids up until I sold my house, at which time I got my house ready really fast, my new home. 
um, so I could have my kids uh, in there. And um, Did there something occur at the beginning of October of 2019 that affected that situation? Yeah. What? Um, what? October 2nd, um, someone parked in front of my house and, and shot at me. Okay. What did you done that morning? You know, I'm going to object to relevancy. I don't know what this has to do with uh, the case at hand. May we approach? Side, yeah, yeah, quick sidebar with counsel on this issue. All right, counsel, there's a ruling under advisement. The court's going to review some previous uh, research and rulings I've made in the case to determine this, so this will be the time we'll use for our mid-afternoon break. Uh, we are going to go till 3.30 today, so we'll try to keep this break to around 15 to 20 minutes to allow the jury to break as well and then we'll come back on the record with additional questioning. So everyone, please rise for the jury. All right, thank you. We're going back on the record, case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. There's been an objection raised that relates to issues that have previously been brought before the court in motions in limine and motions by the state in regards to 404B evidence. Uh, the court finds it appropriate to take up a argument and ruling on the issue at this point outside of the presence of the jurors who have been excused for a mid-afternoon break, so uh, there was an objection raised by the defense. I'd like to hear the response from the state, and then I'll allow a rebuttal argument from the defense before making a ruling. I'll turn on my microphone. And um, the court wants a out in public our response in front of the witness? Yes. Okay. Um, they, um, happy to. Um, Your Honor, the state is believes that this is part of a common scheme and plan. Um, the defendant, um, with her co-conspirators, conspired to cause the death of multiple individuals in her world. She is charged specifically with the death of Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. She's charged with conspiracy on those issues. And um, the state's belief in the electronic evidence, the telephone evidence, the, I, the witness testimonies through those people who participated in these conversations clearly established a conspiracy to remove individuals who were obstacles to her future life together with Chad Daybell and to remove obstacles to um, their plan for this life together. Um, the, um, the shooting of at at and killing of spouses of individuals who were part of this group was part of this common scheme or plan. The financial benefit to Ms. Vallo Daybell's niece at the death of her um, soon-to-be ex-husband um, help, would have helped finance some of the defendant's travels, lives, and movement on in the future. Um, there will be multiple witnesses who discuss um, that uh, the, the, the defendant talked to people that Melanie Boudreaux and her money would take care of them, that Melanie Boudreaux and her money would help aid um, the group's plans for the future. And fundamentally, it is part of a common scheme or plan. It is far more probative than prejudicial. It is part and parcel. The other piece, just from logic in terms of the law enforcement involvement, the shooting at Mr. Baudreau is what actively got law enforcement paying attention, what actively got law enforcement looking for J.J. and Tylee, and it's core to the presentation of many of the law enforcement's assessments of evidence. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Thomas, the response from the defense. Just uh, so that I understand, the state is indicating that this is part of a common scheme or plan and getting rid of spouses is part of the common scheme or plan. 
Judge, it seems like this is a stretch at best. We'd ask the court not to allow this uh, evidence in. It doesn't, uh, without further uh, foundation, through all of these other text messages and whatnot, Mr. Boudreau can be called after uh, some of these things come in to uh, to testify. But I, at this point, I don't think it's appropriate to allow him uh, to testify about these things uh, without any more foundation. Your Honor, may, may I just briefly, you know, this is a chicken or an egg thing. I guarantee you if the state offered those other items, um, the, the defense would be saying it's premature because we don't know what happened. And so in reality, we have the witness here. He had a relationship, and the state is abiding by the previous rulings of the court. We brought it to your attention in camera ahead of time. You've given us a, a ruling in limine, and we are following that ruling. All right. Well, uh, I do agree it is a chicken and an egg thing, as you mentioned, when looking at this evidence. Um, the court has to consider Rule 404B because it's premised on what may be presented in court. Generally, it's brought up outside the presence of the jury and also in advance of trial. The parties have complied with that procedurally. And so we did have a closed hearing relating to this 404B issue back in February of this year. And on February 22nd, the court issued an oral ruling uh, that as a preliminary matter, I would allow the evidence or not prohibit the evidence under Rule 404B and also made findings related specifically to uh, this particular witness and what is alleged to have occurred. Uh, I've considered whether or not the order of things should require more foundation before we go into it at this point, but I don't really see a better way uh, other than to admonish and caution the state that at this point I'll permit the 404B evidence to be admitted. Um, however, uh, at this stage of the proceedings, there's not really a record that goes into the common scheme or plan in the detail that you've indicated. However, there was a proffer made by the state at the previous ruling, and again, a proffer today that that evidence will be forthcoming. So I'll overrule the objection and allow the evidence uh, but the I guess danger for the state there is if sufficient evidence does not come in later to support the allegations that take this outside of 404B then we may have an issue with the jury having heard this testimony so uh, the court will rely on the proffers made today and previously in overruling that objection and I'll allow this line of questioning based on that and my prior finding made at that February 22nd ruling that was briefed and argued by the parties before. So that will be the court's decision on the evidentiary objection at this point. We will now bring the jurors in and just before I do that I will advise and caution the witness here who although you've heard a lot of legal argument here you're still required to just uh, tell only what you know from your own personal experience uh, in answering these questions and could be subject to further objections if you go outside of that based on anything you heard here in legal argument. So with that in mind, that's the court's ruling at this time. Uh, we'll have the jury returned, and then you can continue your examination, Ms. Smith. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Boudreau, do you have water up there? Okay.
All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, Ms. Smith, you can continue your questioning. I'll remind the witness you're still under oath. Um, Mr. Boudreau, you were telling us uh, about um, being shot at on October 2nd of 2019. Do you yes. remember that? All right, um, let's back up. Where did you, you been that morning? Um, I had my kids, so when we woke up, I got them ready for school. Um, my two uh, older kids were in elementary school, so I dropped them off at, at their school. Um, my, my third youngest uh, went to a daycare preschool, and then I dropped my very youngest off at their mom's house, Melanie. Me Melanie Boudreaux's home? Yes. Okay. Um, now, uh, what did you do after that? Um, after that, I uh, drove to the, my gym where I worked out. Okay. And um, this occurred down in Arizona, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then what did you do after going to the gym? Did you head home? Yeah, so I left the gym and I drove home. As I was driving home, um, I lived on the second house in um, off of, I would make a left-hand turn onto my street, and I was the second house in. Okay, let me ask you, how long had you lived in that home? Only a few days. I, um, Like I said, I sold my house previously, um, and in a rush to get make sure that I got my kids um, that, that coming um, weekend, I um, had uh, just moved everything myself, and, and then two of my neighbors noticed me moving. Uh, I just taken. Let me let me just stop you there. How long had you lived at that house? Only a few few days. Okay. And while you were at that, how who knew you lived at that house? Um, maybe maybe five people. Okay. And who were those five? Um, my neighbors who helped me move, and uh, Melanie, who I had to tell. Okay. okay. Um, so you're heading home that morning, and you turn on the street. What happens next? Um, as I came around the corner. Um, I noticed there was a Jeep parked right in front of my driveway. Um, my driveway would have been, um, like this and the Jeep was just parked right directly in front of it. Um, and, uh, as I, as I was starting to drive towards it and I would have had to make a left hand turn into it, I, um, I noticed a few things that stood out to me. The first was that it, but was, what were the things that you noticed? Oh yeah. Um, I noticed that it was parked really closely, um, almost touching the, the van that had been parked there the previous several days. Um, it had a Texas license plate and, uh, it, the Jeep, it was a Jeep Wrangler and Wranglers have a, a, um, a tire on the back of them and there was no tire on this one. Instead, the window was kind of hanging, uh, open, but like the, the little tab things were like sitting on the outside of it. Okay. Um, so you, you see those things about the Jeep. What happens next? Um, as, as I drove forward, the window came up, and I saw a, a gun with what looked like a silencer. I um, heard a bang, and my driver's side window shattered. Um, and so my natural re reaction, instead of turning left into my driveway, um, I, I drove an electric car, so it was very instant, but I just pushed the gas, and it just shot me forward. Okay. Um. What happened after your car, your window is shot out? Um, I continue to drive, and when you, um, when you, when you're in a, a Tesla, the, the electric car, you let your foot off the gas, it, it, it breaks. And so, I remember when I hit it, my phone flew forward, um, and then as I kind of came around the corner, I remember letting my foot off, and it came back. Grabbed my phone, I called nine one one. I went around the corner, and I parked next to. Um, the public pool there for a second, um, 
And then I remember as I was talking to the 911 person, I saw the Jeep come around the corner and I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I started to try to follow it. And, um, and then the, the person told me that was a bad idea. So I, or, or I thought it, I'm not a hundred percent sure which, but I, I went back over and, and they instructed me to park in front of my house. So I parked in front of my house and then police arrived. Okay. Um, did the, you give the police the information on that Jeep? I did. Yes. Okay. And did you follow up with law enforcement down in Arizona? Um, yeah, after F. So, uh, so th- thanks. And so now my next, my next question is, um, did you take any steps after cooperating with law enforcement to, to identify that Jeep? I did. Yes. What did you do? Um, well, after, after it, it, you know, it took all day to go through, like once this happened, but after a long amount of time, um, in the process, I had met with a detective and talked to him about just thoughts that I had about what was going on. He was just asking me, um, trying to, trying to get a handle on it. And, um, as I was thinking about that, I realized that, um, Tylee had a Jeep that Charles had bought her with a Texas plate that looked exactly like that. And I knew the VIN number because Charles had given it to me. So I gave that to the police officer, to my detective. Okay. Um, what color was that Jeep? Um, it was a, a grayish green color. Okay. okay. And um, did the, the Jeep you saw had no tire on the back? Correct. Okay. Um, did you take any steps then also to provide it? Uh, I'm sorry, you told us you gave vi- the VIN to law enforcement? Forgive me. How did you get that VIN? Charles had given it to me previously. Why would he give you a VIN? Oh, I was a insurance agent at the time, and um, he had given it to me to run insurance across all of their different cars. Okay. Um, and so you provided that to law enforcement, correct? I did, yes. All right. Um, what other steps, if any, did you take to follow up on uh, that Jeep um, that you believe to be Tylee's Jeep and the shooting at you? Um, I had called and talked to... Um, uh, Adam Cox and Zach Cox, um, because they had also, um, had concerns about everything going on. And, okay. Uh, other than talking to somebody, what other steps did you take? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, did you, um, look at any information on the internet? Uh, about the Jeep? Or following up on the shooting at you. Oh, yes. Yeah, I did. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, That's all right. Yeah, after, um, after my shooting, I um, started to have my beliefs about who I thought did it, and I got concerned about um, the situation. And so um, I started thinking back to um, previous stuff that had happened, uh, and I, I remembered that... Um, in these groups, there were people who I didn't know, but I remember there was a bunch of emails Charles had sent me. So I went through and reread those. Okay. And, um, and did you see any names in the emails that you were looking at? When you say those groups, you're talking the groups of people that your wife was meeting in these firesides? Yeah. Yeah. She, she was meeting a bunch of, uh, people that didn't necessarily have, that were, said they were members of the church, but didn't have any, like, necessary connection to the church. <laughs> and, and in that process, some of them would, you know, write books or do things, and she would um, get into some of this stuff. Um, and I remember distinctly inside of these groups, there was uh, emails that were being sent with a, a, a group of them. Um, and so I just went back to look at the emails Charles had sent me from there, um, and, and, and most of them came from a Chad Daybell. And since I didn't know who he was, I started Googling his name. Okay. And um, in that process of Googling his name, what did you see? Um, you know, I uh, I was just going through some of the things that were there, and I saw uh, uh, on uh, an obituary for a Tammy Daybell. Okay. Um, and after you saw that, um, did you take any steps to follow up on the, on what you saw? Yes. Um, it made me really uh, nervous because Charles... It- so let me ask you the question now. What steps did you take? Oh, sorry. Um, right. Because of how I was feeling, my nervousness, um, I reported it to law enforcement and told them that in my gut something felt wrong, and I just asked them to follow up. Okay. Now, um, somewhere in here, did you learn that um, JJ and Tyler were missing? 
Yeah. Um, as, as things progressed and I came to my opinion about who it was that shot at me, I started to, um, try to be proactive and, um, hoping to get information, doing whatever I could. And, uh, in that process, um, we found out that, um, no one had seen from, uh, Tylee or JJ. Okay. Um, Your Honor, the state is going to ask the court for the mission of state's exhibit uh, number five. It has some additional stickers on it that, that aren't relevant to this hearing, but the sticker is on the back. It's state's exhibit five, which is a self, uh, self-authenticating document, which is the birth certificate for Tylee Ryan, showing a date of birth of 9-24-2002. Uh, And, Your Honor, we did not make extra copies of that. That because it's in an evidence envelope, I certainly can if the court wants. I've had an opportunity to review that, so um, all right. So to be clear, it, it is marked previously with <coughs> Exhibit Four stickers, but this is State's Trial Exhibit Five. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Would you show the witness? And just for the record, it, what does it that document reflect? Uh, it says Tylee Ryan. Your Honor, I'm going to object here. I don't think he has personal knowledge of what's what he's just. Anybody can just read the document. Well, and I understand the document. First of all, it's not been admitted yet. Oh, I apologize. Um, so let's figure out where we are with that. I apologize. I thought the court had admitted it. The state moved for the admission of State's Exhibit Five. Any objection? As to the document being, being admitted, a birth certificate, we have no objection to the fact that it's a birth certificate. Okay, so Exhibit 5 is admitted. And then uh, you can continue with your questioning now that it's been admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, on State's Exhibit 5, which has been admitted, um, what's the date of birth listed for Tylee Ryan? 9-24-2002. Okay. Um, your Honor, the state um, also at this time would offer to the court state's exhibit number six. Um, I would um, give an opportunity to both give it to the court and to um, ask the witness to look at it. Original on top, court copy underneath. I think again I have the I think I have the original now. I think they probably all have stickers, Judge. One should oh. say the word original on it. Okay, mine does not. So okay, good. The sticker. All right, thanks. Thank you. May I proceed, Judge? Yeah, it well again also this has been offered now but not yet admitted. Well, I was gonna have the witness identify it first, but I wanted to give it to you before I okay. did that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, do you recognize State's Exhibit Number Six? Yes, I do. Okay, what is it? Uh, it's a picture of Tylee from her Instagram. Okay, um, and uh, is it true and accurate picture of Tylee in her teenage years? Yeah. Okay, move for the admission of State's Exhibit Number Six. Any objection? May I uh, bond your aid? You may. <clears throat> you indicate that this is a photograph of Tylee. From her Instagram, is that right? Yes. Okay, and how do you recognize that? Um, I'm friends with her on Instagram. You're friends on Instagram with her? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, you saw this pop up on your Instagram? Yes, I have. Okay. You didn't take the photograph? No, I did not. Okay. You don't know if it's been Photoshopped or, I mean, it looks like her, right? Yes. But you're not positive that uh, whatever's on the photograph or in the photograph is, is legitimate. You, just, you, don't, you weren't there when the photograph was taken. I was not there when this photograph was taken. Your Honor, the only objection I have is that um, it's 
not an original. We don't know who the photographer is. We don't know if it's been photoshopped. We don't know if it's been altered in any way. All right, understood. Response? Um, Your Honor, that's not the foundation for the admissibility. Um, if defense counsel's concerns, they go to the weight, not necessarily the admissibility. This witness has said he is familiar with the person who's in the picture, he's familiar with her Instagram, and he knows whether it's a fair and accurate depiction of Tylee Ryan. All right. I've considered that objection. I think uh, what we have here is a, it, it has been, it will be admitted um, for illustrative purposes in terms of evidentiary value without further foundation about who precisely or when took the picture or where. If we're going beyond that, I'd have concerns. So it is admitted for the purpose of demonstrating who is shown in the picture. Thank you, Your Honor. Is the machine on? Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that the picture of Tylee? Yes. Okay. Um, now you indicated that you were aware that um, JJ and Tylee were missing in the fall of 2019, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you ever learn whether JJ and Tylee had been found? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, where were you when you learned that JJ and Tylee had been found? Uh, I was in my parents' home in that garage. Okay. Sorry, just a second. I was in my parents' home in their garage. Okay. All right. Um, and when you became aware of this issue, did you travel somewhere? I did. Um, it was the, the day before my wedding. Um, okay. They weren't certain, so I had my wedding. Okay. And then the next day I came up to Rexburg. Okay, what date was that? Uh, it would have been June 11th. Okay, of what year? Or June. Um, of 2020. Okay. Um, what happened once you got in Rexburg? Um, I, uh, I drove up. Um, I didn't know why, but I just felt like I should come up. And so I came up and uh, I met with Larry and Kay and Woodcock. And, uh, and did law enforcement ask you to do anything? Yes, they uh, they had asked me if I could identify um, JJ. And did you do that? Yes, I did. Um, how did that happen? Um, I, I drove uh, to a place where they showed me some pictures of him and asked if I could identify him, and I did. Okay. Um, and those were images showed you by Rexburg police officers and FBI agents, correct? Yes. Okay. One moment, please, Your Honor. I want to ask you a couple of quick questions to make sure I didn't ask confusing questions. Um, to be clear, what date were you shot at? October 2nd. Of what year? 2019. Okay. And then over the next month or so, you did Google searches? Yes. Okay. Um, and um, uh, do you remember when you uh, saw evidence that um, Tammy Daybell had died? Um. I want to say that I, I saw it on October 21st, maybe. It might have been the 19th. I can't, I can't say exactly. It's been a few years since then. Okay. I should have reviewed that. I apologize. Sorry. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Mr. Thomas, will you be conducting the cross? Yeah, sure. All right, you can do so.
Just, uh, just really quickly, I want to go through, I want to follow up on what uh, Ms. Smith had said. You said on October the 2nd you were shot at, and then over the next few months you did Google searches? Is that what she, you said? Um, over, the, over the next few months there was times I did Google searches, yes. And what were those Google, Google searches about? Um, well, I, the, the one I think she was referring to was I searched for Chad Daybell's name to figure out um, who he was and try to get more information on him. Okay. Um, so you and your then wife, Melanie, uh, were having some issues back in, uh, 2018, end of 2018, right? Is that right? Um, can you define issues? Well, I mean, at some point you got divorced, right? Yeah, but but in 2018, I, w I wouldn't say that we were at a point where we were looking at divorce. Okay. When did that happen? When did, when did the divorce thing come up? In early 2019? No, not, in, not until June of 2019 was the first time it was ever mentioned. June of 2019. Mm -hmm. And that's when you had gone off to a uh, a business trip, and I come back. No, I was not a business trip. Okay, what was it? We I took my family and we went to her parents' house in Arizona. In Utah. Your parents' house. No, my ex's parents live in Utah. Melanie. Melanie's parents live in Utah, and that's where we were staying. Was in her parents' home. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Um, and at that point, she said something about uh, she had some some issues with you. One of them being that she she said that you, she thought that you were homosexual. Correct. And was that based on what was that based on? Was there any basis to that? She told me that God had told her. God had told her that you were homosexual. Yes. Okay. It had nothing to do with uh, video that one of your friends had posted on Facebook with you being at the Pink Pony dancing around? Correct. Okay. That was something different? The, the only thing that happened with that was after a long uh, argument. Uh, I asked her to give me some logical reasons because it didn't make any logical sense. And uh, the only thing she could think of was that she had seen a video of me dancing with someone at a Pink Pony club which was available to anybody to see on, on, on Facebook. It was just public. And where, where's the pink pony? Objection, Your Honor. I understand this is cross, but it's getting pretty far afield. Uh, all out at this time, it's proper cross. Uh, it's, it's in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Okay. And then in... Um, as we indicated, October 2nd, you were, you, you believe you were shot at, and you believe that, um, the Jeep that held the gun that was shooting at you was a Jeep Wrangler? Yes. And you believe that that to be Tylee's Jeep Wrangler? Yes, I do. Okay. And you indicated that you had actually tried to, uh, follow that Jeep Wrangler, is that right? For a few seconds, yes. Okay. And did you get the license plate? I was not able to get the license plate. How far away from the Jeep Wrangler were you? Uh, at that point, I was very far away. It was, um, uh, I could bear, I, I barely saw it. It was over at the corner of the neighborhood, and I was um, very far in a distant corner. I just saw the, the Jeep had come around that ag angle, and it turned right around and went the other way. So, so how, how far away was the shot that you think came from, you think it came from the Jeep Wrangler. How far away was the Jeep Wrangler from your car when the shot was made? Um, the, the car was parked probably a little further than the distance of where you're at to me. Me to you? Yeah, a little bit further. 30 feet, 20 feet? Somewhere in there. Okay. And you indicated that only 
uh, probably five people knew where you had lived at the time? Yes. And you don't believe this to be a stray bullet or some, some something other than you, you're pretty positive that this came from that Jeep? Yes. Okay. Did you see a muzzle flash from the Jeep? Um, I saw the uh, what looked like, a, as I described before, a silencer. Um, but I can't say that I saw the muzzle flash. And was that in your rearview mirror? No, it was straight in front of me. Straight in front of you? Yeah, I was looking straight at it. Okay. So you saw a silencer, but you didn't see any type of flash when the shot was taken? I can't say for certain that I did. Okay. It's possible that that shot came from somewhere else? No. Okay. You indicated, and I think council, uh, council for the state and I were both somewhat taken aback when you said that you knew the VIN number of the Jeep, and you indicated that you were the uh, insurance agent on the Jeep. I was no longer the insurance agent, um, but I ran it for Charles. He had given me the information. What do you mean by that? Well, he wanted me to price shop, so he gave me the VIN number for each of the vehicles that they had. And when was that? Um, a few months earlier, maybe around April. Okay. And you, he had done that in an email or a text or something like that? Yeah, it was just in my text. Okay. Do you have that text still? Um, I... I'm not, I'm not sure if it was a text or if it was an email. It, honestly, I'm not sure exactly how I got that, that bin, but I know he gave it to me. He may have emailed it. Um, Did you? Go ahead. I'm just not, I'm not certain which Did, way he gave it to me. Did you turn that information over to the police or to the prosecutor? I did, yes. That email? Um, no, I, I turned over all the, the VIN number to the detective at the time. And they didn't ask you how you got the VIN number? Um, I, it was a long time ago. I can't tell you for certain. I just told, just told him the VIN number. Okay. Um, you indicate uh, that you were rereading some emails from Charles to yourself uh, at some point. Did you turn those emails over to the prosecutor or to the police? I did, yes. Okay. And what were those emails about? Um, the emails were uh, from from Charles to the rest of the family. Um, and then some of them were, uh, in, you know, in his concerns about what he thought was going on um, in his relationship with Lori as they went through their breakup. Um, and separately, there were other emails that were um, kind of his evidence that he was giving us of these groups that she was meeting with. I'm, I'm a little bit confused because you indicate that you were rereading emails I thought, and maybe it was this is me, I thought they were from Charles to you, not to his family. I am part of his family. He sent them to all of us. Okay. So these were group emails that you were a part of the group email? Correct. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Um, when you found out that uh, they had found the remains of Tylee and JJ. You indicate that you had a wedding on, looks like, June the 10th, and then you went up to Rexburg on June the 11th. Is that right? Yes, I believe it was the 11th. It might have been the 12th. I didn't review my notes on that either, so I should have. Okay. Um, and you indicate that you met with Kay and, and, and Larry Woodcock? I did, yes, that morning. Did you meet with anybody else? Um, no, I talked to law enforcement over the phone. Talked to law enforcement over the phone while you were in Rexburg? Yes. Okay. You didn't talk to law enforcement over the phone while you were uh, still in Utah or Arizona or where you were living at the time? Um, are you talking about on that specific day? Yeah. Um, or the day before, or, you know. I can't recall specifically if I met with them. I don't think I did, but I might I might have met with them in person besides the phone call. I did meet with them in person when I looked at the pictures. Okay. 
And so then you said that law enforcement asked you if you could identify Tylee and JJ? Um, just, just JJ. Just JJ. And so what was that conversation like? I mean, they didn't ask uh, somebody like Kay or Larry or somebody who was closer to JJ? Or they just came to you? I mean, I, th I think I was as close to JJ as Kay and Larry. We were all family. Um, they uh, had initially asked Larry, but um, it's a pretty overwhelming task to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if it was with his health where it was, if it was something he was up for, so I, I said I would. So you were there when they were having the conversation with Kay and Larry about who was going to identify JJ? I was, I was there after the conversation and talking to them. Oh, okay. All right. You don't have no further questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Will there be any redirect? I, no, Your Honor. All right. That will conclude the testimony of this witness then. Thank you, Mr. Boudreau. Thank you. You can go ahead and step down from the witness box. Your Honor, a uh, quick question. Um, Mr. Boudreau does not live in this. Mr. Boudreau does not live in this state. Is he released from his subpoena? Any objection? We're not going to recall him. Okay. No, I don't have any objection. Very well. You can be released from your subpoena Thank as you. well then. Thank you for appearing and testifying.